All right. So no intro to here. This is going to be a solo cast. Um, I just wanted to bring back, I felt moved to really bring back a couple of posts I writ, a post I wrote, I had written uh, a couple uh, a couple months ago before I got sick and had to, to take a break and just share some additional thoughts on that. And uh, so let's just dive right into this. So the first one here was this one here, um, grooming Satan, workers, scriptures, CSA, SA, so all, all the usual kind of trigger warnings here. And uh, I, I wanted to have this on record, uh, also maybe just an audio version of it as well. And so I'll kind of read the post, and uh, there's one other post I want to share as well. And then I may I may pause and just share a couple of thoughts on this as well. But uh, I just feel like, uh, you know, on a, something like a Facebook page, it's getting dozens of posts a day, stuff like this kind of gets buried. So I wanted to have a more permanent record of this. So I'm going to share a couple of things, share a couple of thoughts on this, probably uh, say some things that might, I don't know, make some people mad. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll just add one more thing before I dive into to reading this, is I'm going to say anything that I share here uh, on this recording, I'm willing to be corrected on. I'm willing to stand corrected. I'm willing for someone to say, hey, I think you got it wrong here. Um, so very open to that. But this is this is where I'm at. This is what I feel moved to share, moved to speak about. Um, but I don't claim to have it all figured out or to have everything right. And so if you feel like I'm off base or I've missed the mark or anything like that, uh, please feel free to to offer your thoughts and correction. I may or may not agree with you, but uh, I, wanna, I always want to be open to hearing other people's thoughts, perspectives, and potential correction if you feel like I'm out of place. So... With that being said, um, let's dive in. Yeah, the term grooving, grooming doesn't send shivers on your spine. It should. Grooming is satanic evil. Does that sound hyperbolic? Let me break it down. Satanic equals of Satan, a.k.a. the devil. When we think of satanic, we often think of some pretty wild rituals and symbolism that I'm not going to describe here. But what is said about the devil? That he masquerades as an angel of light. Is there anything more evil than presenting yourself as a literal messenger of God with a desire to destroy souls. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 to 15. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. That is to say, it's not surprising if servants of Satan disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. That's quite that's quite profound there. So then I wrote, if Satan took on human form, he would be smiling, handsome, charismatic, a great storyteller, well-versed in scripture, impeccably dressed in a three-piece suit, maybe a worker, an overseer, an elder. Oof, that's pretty inflammatory too. Behind that mask of a smiling face that can speak so eloquently about scripture is an evil predator who cares nothing for a single soul. Every interaction is calculated to win your trust, to deceive, to manipulate, to control your perception, all while making you believe that you're interacting with a good person who cares deeply and who loves God. What is grooming? Grooming is a premeditated, calculated behavior. It's cold emotionless. Grooming is not an accidental moment of weakness in the flesh. Every interaction is deceptive, manipulative, designed to make you believe the mask you see. Grooming is also a process, winning your trust, months, years, even decades, carefully calculating, winning hearts, building up the lie. The victim, the prey, being brought into this lie because trusted individuals all around them are deceived too, and believe that this predator is a good godly person. Every sermon from the platform, every prayer, every testimony, every handshake, every good deed, helping the elderly, setting up chairs at Gosling, visiting the shut-ins, all a cunning calculation. For what? To trap a victim, to isolate them, even willingly because of trust. To assault them, to rape them repeatedly, smiling while raping a child only concerned with their own selfish pleasure. I'll keep going for a moment in a moment here, but those were some hard words to write. They're still hard words to read. There are workers who have raped children who are still active. Stop and think about that. There are overseers 
who are aware that these things have taken place and are not doing anything. These are spineless men. Noodle spines. Don't know if that's a word, but it is now. Spines made of noodles. Why will they not call it evil? That's a question. If your overseer has not communicated, maybe not from the platform because maybe there's children present, although it sure wouldn't hurt to speak pretty directly about this while maybe covering up a few things that might be too graphic to speak in the presence of children. But if your overseer has not called out this evil, ask yourself why. Why do they refuse to call this out? So, back to the post. Without a trace of conscience, smiling while raping a child, only concerned with their own selfish pleasure. Without a trace of conscience, a child lying there, bleeding, stunned, incapable of fully processing what just happened. This trusted man that everyone says is such a good man, and the predator smiles. This is our little secret. If you tell anyone, God will be angry with you. Now go and clean yourself up. Oof, those are heavy words. And I've heard from more than one person about what their predator said to them. Elders, workers, overseers. Oof. The victim, terrified to speak of what happened, traumatized, brutalized, and the predator goes on to preach the gospel from the platform the next Sunday smiling at the end of the meeting, shaking hands, thanking people. The people leave smiling, thinking, what a great meeting. The spirit was so nice in this meeting. Convention, people coming up after meeting, wanting to shake hands. The predator, smiling, calculating. It's working. Idiots, they'll never know. Servants of Satan, disguising themselves as servants of righteousness. Think about that. Servants of Satan, disguising themselves as servants of of righteousness. This is a pretty harsh criticism. But you want to tell me that an overseer who rapes children is somehow a godly man? Think about that. There are wolves. There are predators. There are evil, evil men. And then there are cowards. There are cowards who are afraid to call it this evil for what it is. So I'd love to hear. I'd love to be corrected on this. Please tell me if I've missed something. Please tell me if you have heard a communication that I haven't come across. I would love to hear that there are overseers who have plainly, clearly, and unequivocally not veiled in euphemistic language directly called out this evil behavior, said there is no place for that in this fellowship. And I will not call it the truth anymore. I call it the fellowship. And on that note, I have this question that someone asked me. Do you think it is blasphemous to call this fellowship the truth? To make this fellowship take the place of Jesus? You know, I think about how did this happen? How did we get here? How did we get to the place where this, this is happening? Not only happening, the cover-up is happening. The denial is happening. The lying is happening. How did we get here? We turned the ministry into an idol. We turned the form of this fellowship into an idol. And we said, this is your path to salvation. You must follow this ministry the way that they go out. You must follow this form, this fellowship, or you cannot be saved. Tell me that's not idolatry. I like this form. I'm a participant in this fellowship. I even like the ideal of this ministry, trying to do what it's trying to do. But we went astray when we turned this into an idol. And in turn, we turned workers and overseers and uberseers and elders into idols. And we put them between us and God. That's how we got here. So back to the post. Servants of Satan disguising themselves as servants of righteousness happening in this fellowship to this day. 
but then something leaks out. A survivor gets brave. Through all the pain, musters immense courage and speaks up. This man raped me. Liar. Troublemaker. Not possible. He's such a good man. He's so helpful. The victim crumbles. Told repeatedly that their reality is false. The survivor gets courage again. Speaks up. But this time the whispers are starting. Don't tell anyone. This will hurt the truth if it gets out. We'll deal with it. You can trust us. Ever heard those words before? The predator is moved. The predator tells his fellow workers, it'll never happen again. Fake sorrow. Oh, I'm so sorry. It was a one-time mistake. It'll never happen again. Baloney. The cycle begins again. Grooming. Grooming is satanic evil. It is a predator, a wolf, preying on vulnerable people. And as a man, it makes me angry that most perpetrators are men. It makes me angry that most covering up are men. It makes me angry that most victims are women and children. There's a book called, a book on child sex trafficking called Men Fight for Me. And I know there's a number of good godly men fighting. I'm friends with a number of them, but we're small in number. Every single man connected to this fellowship should be standing up in anger. You call out the cowards. Call out their silence. The cries of victims, the cries of children. This should enrage you. Any man as a father, as children, has any semblance of decency and righteousness and goodness and godliness in them should be standing up and should be enraged. There should be no silence. Do not give these overseers silence. If you don't take a stand for victim survivors, you are making a stand. You're taking a stand with the rapists, the pedophiles, and the cowards who enable them. Grooming is satanic evil. What side are you on? Which overseers have called out this evil that has perpetrated this fellowship? Which overseers have written, have communicated, have spoken up and said, this evil has no place in this fellowship? Who has said that? I would love to know. Please comment below. Tell me. Correct me. Tell me that I'm wrong, that there are good overseers that are standing up, that are calling out this evil. They're taking a stand for righteousness and truth. They're taking a stand against their fellow corrupted, lying overseers. Overseers have told us, guess what? We're appointed by God. In other words, shut up. You, the peons, don't get any say in our status and our position and our authority. We keep each other accountable. And we're accountable to God. That's what they say. That's gaslighting. <laughs> Nearly a thousand people signed a letter saying, you need to step down because you have failed us. You have failed terribly. And these men refuse to. So those who are listening, who are part of this fellowship, who's your overseer? Have you talked to them? Have you spoken up? Has any overseer showed any kind of spine and courage in terms of taking a stand for truth and righteousness? Has any overseer broken ranks, pardon me, broken ranks to call it fellow overseers? Who called it Leslie White? Not a single one. Who called it Ira Hobbs? Not a single one. Why will these cowards not take a stand for truth? What are they afraid to lose? Where's their faith? You want to tell me that this is a ministry that goes in faith? When there's millions in bank accounts secretively stashed away, how much faith does it take to be an Uber seer when you have access to and control over millions, tens of millions of dollars? Barry Barkley, Ray Hoffman, Lyle Schultz, Rob Newman. You guys are cowards. You're cowards. You're you're supposed to be leaders. In this organization. That being said, did Jesus call you to be overlords? Because you act like it. And maybe you'll lie and tell us you're not. You'll lie and tell us you're humble servants. You're not. Jesus, the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, washed his disciples' feet. That level of humility from the Master, the Lord, the King. Which one of you men has shown that humility towards the victims? Which one of you has heard the cries of the victims and begged for forgiveness? 
shown the humility, the repentance, a heart that is enraged with righteous anger for the evil that has taken place. Who has? Please correct me. Tell me that I'm wrong. Tell me that there are good, godly, righteous overseers who will not be silent on this issue, who stand up for truth and righteousness, who take the name of God seriously, who take the name of Jesus seriously, who take very seriously what they feel is their calling and their vocation to be a messenger of the gospel, the truth, not the truth as we call this fellowship, the actual truth. Who is doing this? I would love to know. And so with that, I want to switch over to the next thing that I wrote. <clears throat> before, I, before I read this, I just want to preface this by saying this came from a vision that I had, a very clear vision that I had, and I had to write about it. It was very early in the morning, I wanted to be in bed and sleeping, and this vision came to me. I didn't see the face of Jesus, but I saw the back of him. And it was so profound and so clear, I had to write this. And so this is what I wrote. Jesus walks into the temple, whip in hand. Jesus, what are you doing? Jesus, don't make a scene. Jesus, what are people going to say about the Jewish faith? Jesus, you're making the temple look bad. Jesus, people are going to talk. This is going to spread like wildfire. Jesus. People aren't going to offer sacrifices now that they know. When Jesus entered the temple, instead of seeing people praying for needs and worshiping God, he saw people praying on vulnerable, innocent people. He saw a marketplace where people were profiting from animals to be sacrificed. He saw greed, people being taken advantage of, desperate, needy people, people needing help, desperate for atonement for sin, predators, praying, not praying as in speaking to God, Praying as in acting like wolves, taking advantage of vulnerable people for their own greed and selfish pleasure. People in positions of respect and authority hurting others and others in positions of authority, knowing this was taking place, turning a blind eye for the sake of appearances. Pharisees, false prophets, hypocrites. And when Jesus finished cleansing the temple, what did he do? He went to the lame, the wounded, the sick the rejects, the outcasts, the poorly dressed, the ones looked down by the pious religious leaders, the sinners. That's what Jesus did when he cleansed the evil. Which of these overseers has went to the victims and said, we're asking for your forgiveness. Maybe they haven't directly been a perpetrator, but over 40%, as far as we know now, and please don't quote me on this as gospel truth, but from what I understand, from what's come forward, over 40% of perpetrators are workers. And they represent probably, what, 2% of our fellowship in terms of congregation? That's hugely disproportionate. You want to tell me that overseers don't bear responsibility? They had no idea this was happening? No idea. No clue. That's a joke. Of course they had a clue. Of course they knew. And what do they do? They hushed it up. Secret meetings. Get this man back. Why? Why is it more important to take a stand for predators than it is for victims? Ask yourself that. Why is it more important to these overseers that they take a stand for predators? Who has dirt on who? Which overseers have dirt on each other? Keeping each other accountable? How about keeping each other in line because they have dirt on each other? I was thinking about this expression in politics called the party clobbering machine. Imagine a young politician whatever, whatever political stripe doesn't matter, goes in full of energy, youthful energy, zeal, excited, passion, ideals. Oh, can't believe what I'm going to be able to do. I'm so passionate about this. I'm so passionate for the cause. Before long, the party clobbering machine just beats that out of them until they fall into line, toe the line, do what the leaders say or else. <laughs> Young worker, excited, feels called, feels moved by God to go and preach the gospel. I'm going to help so many people. And the ministry clobbering machine comes in and turns them into clones. Let's think about that for a second. Real, real, I think, conundrum. Chicken or egg? Were the overseers corrupt to begin with? Or were they corrupted by the structure? 
Were they corrupted by the power, corrupted by the money? Maybe it isn't one or the other. Maybe it's, maybe it's both. They will not call out evil. They will not go to the victims and ask for forgiveness. They lie. Scott lied. Scott Rosser, Rosser, however you say your name, you lied. You lied about what took place when a victim came forward with their story. You lied about how the fact that you made that victim kneel before you with another evil man, a godless man. You lied, Scott. You're protecting a child rapist, Scott. How can you do this? How can you sleep at night knowing you're doing this? Giving a child rapist access to the information of families with children. What is wrong with you? You're going to try and convince me that the Spirit of God is leading you to keep a child rapist in your ranks in secret? Back to the post. So Jesus went to the, the needy. He healed them. He loved them. These people didn't need blind tradition. They didn't need form. They needed Jesus. And if Jesus walked into a convention today, first off, every knee would bow. And this is part of what I saw. When the people looked up, they would see that he had a whip in his hand. And so in this vision for myself, I saw the back of Jesus walking towards the Brother Workers at Glen Valley Convention. For those who don't know, this is a convention in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. So this is what I saw. I saw the back of him whip in hand. He had on sandals, a robe, I guess, perhaps the type of dress that he would have worn when he walked this earth. And he had this whip in his hand and it was headed directly for the brother workers. And he said, you've made this ministry a den of abusers. You've made this ministry a den of abusers. And really we could probably say you've made this fellowship a den of abusers because these men have sheltered abusers, sheltered, covered up, silenced, gaslit, shot up victims, your troublemakers, your liars. <sighs> so Jesus, in the same way that he cleansed the temple, if he walked this earth today, would be headed for the brother workers first. Why? Because you're the ones in authority. You're the ones that are overseeing this crisis. And anyone who tells you there's no crisis is a liar. Think about that. Overseers lying to preserve themselves, to preserve their position, their place. Where's their faith? It's not in God. It's in the money in the bank accounts and the position they have. And if they walk away, they do not have the faith to walk away and take a stand for what is right. They're literally trying to save their own skin. <laughs> Imagine that. So back to the post here. Wolves, cowards, liars, abusers, rapists, child molesters, upholding form and appearances, forsaking truth, justice, mercy for the abused. The priests and money changers, they had a dirty scheme. They were profiting off of people's most powerful need and desire, quite literally, their eternal salvation. And we have overseers, workers, and elders that literally use their position of authority to terrify their victims in silence by threatening eternal damnation as though it was something they controlled. It's not something they control, but they hold this over you. If you believe, if you believe that the only way your soul can be saved is to be a participant in this fellowship and the workers control your access to this fellowship, the overseers, the brothers, the senior workers, they use that to coerce you into silence. Don't talk about this. Jesus didn't walk into the temple and quietly or secretly hold a meeting with their religious leaders. Think about this. How much does it cost to fly to Singapore? 16 overseers. Why Singapore? Why choose this secretive place, this secretive meeting? The peons, you don't get to know what happened there. Singapore, the most expensive city in the world. Why not go to Malaysia? Why not go to a cheaper city? Why spend lavish money on lavish hotels? Because you don't care. That money could have been used to go towards hooking. Why not have a Zoom call? Why not stay up a little bit late if you needed to or get up a little bit early if you needed to? in order to coordinate who needed to be on this call. Why spend thousands, if not tens of thousands, or even hundreds of thousands of dollars to bring all these people together in the most expensive city in the world for the secret meeting? What do you have to hide? Why do you have to go to a place where there's not a large number of friends to have a secret meeting? What are you trying to control? Jesus didn't walk into the temple 
and quietly or secretly hold a meeting. He made such a public example that we're still talking about it 2,000 plus years later. This man raped a sister worker so badly she needed surgery. This worker slept with at least six married women, ruining multiple marriages and breaking apart families. This man raped a boy so many times that the boy committed suicide. This man raped the spirituality out of me. Do you think I'm making this stuff up? Anyone who declares there is no crisis in this fellowship is a liar. The day that I wrote this, there were still brother workers defending child rapists in the ranks. October 2023. And lastly, I concluded this post by saying, I didn't want to be writing this, but these words were burning into my brain. And a voice said, why wait until Sunday? I thought I was done writing. I'd written three letters and uh, all of those I felt very moved to write, getting stronger and stronger in the language that I used. I'm not special. Thousands of people have raised their voice. That's the thing. I don't, I'm not, I'm not doing this because somehow I want people to say that I write great words. And this isn't me trying to have false humility. That's not what this is about. I'm not doing this because I think I'm special. I'm doing this because I'm mad. I'm mad. And look, I, I'm far from perfect. And again, this isn't false humility. This is just, I know that I make mistakes. I know that I get things wrong. I know that I speak out of turn. Sometimes I get hot headed. I know these things, but nonetheless, I'm a father of two young children. I do not want them to become victims. That's why I'm passionate. That's why I'm angry. And these men, these cowards that will not take a stand for truth, they won't take a stand for truth, justice, mercy, righteousness, but instead want to preserve their place, their position, and their authority. That's where their faith is. Their faith is not in God. Their faith is not in God to provide. What happened? Did the money turn them into cowards? Craig Winquist. You have some hope for you, fella. Seemed like you were saying the right things. You wanted to do something. And what happened? Did the Uber seers get to you? Did they threaten you? Did they threaten your place, your position, your power, your authority? Did they threaten that? And silence you, whip you back into line. Barry Barkley, Ray Hoffman, Lyle Schultz, Rob Newman, Richard Denherter. Are you whipping these guys back into line? Is that what you're doing? When someone tried? Daryl Doland, Washington. I still have some hope. You're trying, but I bet these guys are pressuring you. Who is a godly man who will take a stand for righteousness. Every Everyone who's still part of this fellowship should be asking their overseers this. Will you take a stand and will you unequivocally say this evil has no place in our fellowship? Will you take that stand and plainly say, will you do that? A lot of them won't. That raises a lot of questions. So I'm not special. These stiff-necked, proud Pharisees are still fighting to preserve themselves. So much for faith in God to provide. So people have asked me, why do you stay in this fellowship? They haven't kicked you out yet. Maybe they will after recording this video. But I'm not going to walk away from this fellowship. If everyone who is fighting this evil walks away, all that's left is abusers, prey, and blind sheep. Anyone who has walked away, I don't fault you for one second. I wouldn't hesitate to break bread with you because Jesus is the way. So, this is what I wanted to say. Now I'm here in Canada. Now, if I've missed communication, if I've missed letters that have gone out because maybe I got cut off from communication for being a vocal advocate, then please, somebody clarify, somebody correct me, somebody help me to see things more clearly. Mike Hassett, have you communicated about this unrighteousness, this evil, this satanic, demonic evil that's in this fellowship? The wolves? Have I missed it? Or have you been silent about it? I think so. There's no crisis in the kingdom. There is a crisis. A very, very terrible one. Jim Atchison. Your name's on the list. And it's not a good one. Is that why you're silent? There's those whispers. What are you hiding? Mike, there's skeletons in your closet. Did you do something you're not proud of? Is that what you're hiding? Do you have dirt on each other? Is that why you won't take a stand for righteousness and truth? Merlin Affleck. I don't know what to make of you, man. Because I thought you were a good guy. And you're a noodle swine. 
Do these other overseers beat up on you? Do they threaten you? Do they smack you back in the line? Like, why is it so hard to take a stand for truth, for righteousness, for the things that God values, things that Jesus values? The law and the commandments, it all hung on what? Two things, Jesus said. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Someone who loves God, would they tolerate this evil? Love your neighbor as yourself. Who's your neighbor? Anybody who's in need. The man in the ditch. <laughs> Bleeding victims. Where do they stand? I don't know. So I did want to share a couple uh, bits of scripture really, really quickly here. If you're still here, um, I hope you found this helpful. Maybe you'll want to speak up. Matthew 7, 16 to 23. I won't read the whole thing. You'll know them by their fruits. Every good tree bears good fruit. Every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit. A bad tree cannot produce good fruit. You will know them by their fruits. What are the fruits? Where's the fruits? Where's the repentance? Where's the sackcloth and ashes? Where's the sorrow? Where's the asking for forgiveness? Where's the love for the victims? Where's the heart for the needy, the wounded, the ones who don't follow the form, who don't look perfect? Have I missed it? Have I been so disconnected that I've missed this? I'd love to learn that I've missed this. Please correct me. I've said it before. I'll say it again. If I'm wrong, please show me the way. Show me the light. Show me what I've missed. Show me these godly, righteous men standing strongly for truth, fearless. Not afraid to stand up against the cowards. Not afraid to stand up against the corrupt. Which oversees broken ranks? What dirt do they have on each other? Joel, um, Joel 1 and 13. Um, I'll share this. Gird yourselves with sackcloth and lament, O priests. Maybe we could say this for the workers. Gird yourselves with sackcloth and lament, O workers. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Wail, O workers on the platform. Wail, O overseers of the ministry, gird yourself with sackcloth. Come spend the night in sackcloth, O ministers of God. For the grain offering, the drink offering are withheld from you from your uh, from the house of your God. We haven't seen that. Or I haven't seen that. And if I've missed it, show me, please. Last thing I wanted to touch on real quick here. I'm certainly not going to read this whole thing. I just want to highlight a couple of phrases from this Nehemiah chapter 9. Because I think it's relevant and pertinent here. On the 24th day of this month, the sons of Israel assembled with fasting in sackcloth with dirt upon them. I don't even know what sackcloth looks like. I'm not saying you physically have to put on sackcloth and rub dirt on your face. There's a spirit that accompanies that. A spirit of humility a spirit of sorrow, a spirit of repentance, a spirit of acknowledging and confessing sin, confessing failures, confessing shortcomings, not in this platitudes, uh, uh, placating false humility kind of way, earnest, weeping, sorrowful. Where is this? We don't see it. Overseers, how much are you spending on lawyers? How much money are you spending on lawyers to protect yourselves? to protect yourselves from prosecution, to hide from the truth. How much money are you spending on lawyers that you're not spending or putting towards victims? Is that the real reason why you're not saying anything? You're not taking a stand? You're not publicly putting any words on record? The lawyers are telling you to be silent? Are you planning on just waiting this out? Waiting until people get angry and leave? Or are the excommunications going to start again? Are you going to kick me out? Because I'm angry and I'm angry at the cowardice. I'm angry at those who won't stand for truth and righteousness. I'm not perfect. I'm not even trying to be a martyr here. I just don't get it. How can you claim to be a minister of God, a minister of the gospel, and not take a stand for truth and righteousness? Where is that? Carry on, status quo, bury it, put it behind us. And I don't know. Maybe God's hardened your hearts. Maybe you're stiff-necked, hard-hearted anyways. I really don't know. I don't have answers. 
I know I have to have trust in God. I know I've spoken about the long suffering of God. God's witnessed this. God has not missed a single thing. God has not missed a single one of my own sins. Everything I've done is known before God. I've done my best to confess them before God so that I can have a clean, a clean conscience, but I'm far from perfect. You overseers who are corrupt, you overseers who lie, you overseers who lie publicly, you overseers who cover up for rapists and pedophiles, who make them elders, who make them overseers, who create victims because of your cowardice and spinelessness. God has not missed this. I'm not trying to call down any kind of judgment or vengeance. That's not my place to do. But what I am trying to do is raise my voice and say, every one of you should be standing up for truth and righteousness in whatever way that looks like for you, but you should not be cowardly in a cowardly fashion hiding. What will it take? What will it take for you to stand up and speak truth without a filter? I don't know. So this, this, this ninth chapter of Nehemiah, a couple of things that I felt like were pertinent here. Now, some of it, of course, just describes um, how God has helped the children of Israel and so on and so forth. Um, And what did it say here? Sorry, should have read this beforehand and then I would have picked some stuff out. Basically, it shows how God has made provision, but they acted, they, our fathers, acted arrogantly. They became stubborn. They would not listen to your commandments. They refused to listen. Acted arrogantly, became stubborn, would not listen to the greatest commandments. What are those commandments? Love the Lord your God, your Love Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hangs on those two things. Every other thing hangs on those two things. When they committed great blasphemies, you in great compassion didn't leave them. You gave them all these things. And then what did they do? They became disobedient and rebelled against you. Cast your law behind the backs. Kill the prophets who admonished them committed great blasphemies. Now I'm not suggesting that these overseers have directly killed anybody or anything like that, but they've certainly worked to silence people who speak up, excommunicate them, kick them out, gaslight them, tell everybody about how evil they are for speaking up, silencing the voices of people trying to speak up and say something. You've done that. Has anyone ever apologized for that? Or kicking people out for trying to speak the truth? Silenced, silenced, ignoring the law. Again, it says they acted arrogantly, didn't listen to your commandments. They turned a stubborn shoulder, stiffened their neck, would not listen. And it speaks of how God is long suffering. And so I really feel like, I wonder, why is this still happening? And, uh, this is just my opinion, but I just wonder if, if God is letting these corrupt men stay in their places until more people become awake. Maybe there's more stuff to come out. Who knows what these men are hiding, why they're closing ranks, having secret meetings, flying each other around the world. Who knows what they're doing, what they're covering up. So maybe this is going on until more can be shown and revealed. Maybe that's what's happening. Maybe this is dragging on so more and more people see that they're corrupt. And maybe I'll just finish by saying this. Every sincere and good worker out there who has felt called to preach and minister the gospel, this is not directed at you. If you're sincere, you felt called to go and preach the gospel, and you've done your best in absolute sincerity to speak truth and righteousness, this is not directed at you. 40% of perpetrators from what we understand right now, our workers, what's wrong? This ministry is sick. And if this ministry is sick, it starts at the top. Who will take a stand for truth and righteousness? Who will demonstrate the spirit of sackcloth and ashes and repentance? Who will help the wounded in the ditch? Who will unequivocally declare that this evil has no place in this fellowship? Who will declare plainly, Have I missed anything? If I have, please tell me. If I've said anything out of turn, please tell me. I am open to correction. But Ray, Barry, 
Rob, Richard, Jerome, Kelvin down in Florida, kicking people out. Why? For speaking up. Still happening today. Kicking people out for speaking up. Now, again, we recognize this form and this ministry don't hold the keys to our salvation. Otherwise, we have a workspace salvation. We're saved through grace, saved by grace through Jesus. So, you're still here. Thanks for listening. I hope at least it's given food for thought. Like I said, if I spoke another turn, if I've misspoken, if I've said something wrong, said something incorrectly, please speak up, share in the comments, write to me privately. Whatever it is you feel like you need to share, communicate with me. I'm open to hearing it. I'd love to be wrong. I'd love to hear that they're righteous, godly men filled with righteous, virtuous, godly anger standing up against the evil that is in this fellowship and the evil that has perpetrated this ministry. Some I haven't seen it yet, heard it yet, but maybe I missed it. So if I have, please let me know. All right. Hope we have a good new year.